Hey YouTube, Andy Smith here. If you've watched this channel, you know that my favorite fantasy of all time is the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Not only because it is a great series in its own right, but because it is very thoughtfully a postmodern, post-structuralist critique of the fantasy genre. And for a long time, I've been wanting to do a video explaining what I mean by that and sort of do a long form description of what those terms mean and why I think Malazan is such a unique series. And so this is this video. I got out my three piece suit and my cup and saucer and tea so I could be taken seriously as I talk about philosophy. So let's do this. So why am I making this video? For a couple of reasons. First, I know there are a lot of people out there who haven't read Malazan Book of the Fallen and find it intimidating. And so through this, I wanna offer some tools to help understand what Erickson is doing in the series as a whole, and also to whet your appetite and maybe make you a little bit more excited to pick up the series. I know there's a lot of fantasy out there to read, and I would really encourage you to pick up this series and give it a try. Secondly, a lot of people, especially on this channel, who love Malazan, and I wanna give you some more vocabulary to describe to other people why it's so great and some of the great things that perhaps you didn't recognize if you're not a philosophical junkie like me. Thirdly, and this is a really important group of people I wanna to talk to, are people who have read Malazan and didn't really care for it and gave it some critiques. Now, I wanna be very clear here that I that's totally okay. Malazan is not for everyone, just like any piece of art is not for everyone. You don't have to like it. But I do think some of the criticisms that are often leveled at it are maybe not unfair, but categorized incorrectly. Uh, a lot of people I, I see who don't like Malazan say things like there are too many characters, or the plot was confusing, it wasn't focused, things like that which are understandable critiques, but I also think that they do so without recognizing what Erickson is doing as a postmodern, post-structural writer. It's kind of like the person who goes into an art museum and sees an impressionist Monet and says, I don't like that painting because the lines aren't clear enough. Well, that's true and you don't have to like it, but it's done that way on purpose. And in the same way, I think that about Malazan. Sometimes people complain about things that are done on purpose and you don't have to like it, but I think it's good to have sort of an educated understanding of why it is like that. So that's why I'm making this video. Let's get right into the meat of it because I think this is gonna be a pretty long video. First off, postmodernism. It is super hard to define exactly what postmodernism is because as the name suggests, it really is a wide range of opinions and critiques against modernism and building on modernism in critical ways rather than one particular viewpoint or new idea. So to really be able to define postmodernism, first I'm gonna step back and talk about modernism. Modernism is equally a very large concept across a lot of different fields of studies. But at its heart, modernism believes in human achievement and human betterment through knowledge and self-improvement. Modernism was at its height during what a lot of historians call the long 19th century. Long because it's not necessarily the 100 years that is normal for a century, but in historical epoch terms, it is the period in human history from 1789, the French Revolution, going all the way to the advent of World War I in uh, the 19 teens, or depending on who you talk to, all the way to the 1930s and the beginning of World War II. And during this era in human history, a lot of huge innovations pushed humanity forward, or at least that was the view of people at the time. The Industrial Revolution caused great wealth to explode in many European countries. Political revolutions, as I already mentioned, like the French Revolution or just a little earlier, the American Revolution was bringing new ideas of democracy to a lot of the world's major and traditional powers. Trade was expanding. 
As rural agrarianism became more effective, cities and major population centers exploded in population, and this also exploded uh, universities, uh, metaphorically obviously, in ideas that were put forth in things like physics and chemistry, the natural sciences. All of these things were seeing a push forward, and by all that movement, the general oeuvre or thought of the modern period was that humanity was was elevating itself, eventually going to reach this sort of nirvanic state of humanity being good through innovation, through technology, through progress. Philosophically, this century was dominated by Hegel, and you've probably heard that name in your Philosophy 101 course. At its most basic, Hegelianism, in a lot of different forms, saw the uniting of different ideas into a synthesis that would push humanity forward. Just as a basic example, capitalism was very, very popular, but there were some abuses, and so Marxism is sort of the opposite, the antithesis to capitalism. And there would be a struggle there, but through that struggle, there would be a synthesis of bad ideas that would form a better idea. And then whatever that better idea would be, there would be another antithesis, they would have a little squabble, and that would create another synthesis, and things would continue to improve, and the world spirit or the world sort of push would eventually create this really, really great society. This is what modernism really believes at its heart, in knowledge and in progress for humanity. And especially, modernism sought that progress and sought that perfection towards institutions and institutions that would unite people, larger people. So things like the family, nation, religion, identity, even racial identities became very, very important because they unified and they created structure from which this innovation and this progress was being made. Unfortunately, all of this talk came to a screeching halt. The reason that the 19-teens is the end of that century of progress is, of course, as many of you know, World War I. And these things that were pushing progress, that were pushing goodness, at least in the viewpoint of modernism, actually, all of a sudden, turned to destruction. Rank nationalism caused World War I and this crazy loss of life. And once we push even further into the 1920s, capitalism gone amok caused massive depression worldwide in a scale never before seen. Pushed to the 1930s and racism and ethnic identity pushed to its extreme and accepted in Germany caused World War II. And again, destruction never seen in the world since. Even democracy pushed to its extreme and in the defense of that democracy bought us the nuclear bomb, which brought, again, destruction. So modernism and this idea of progress was quite obviously in the mid 20th century in crisis. And out of that arose a lot of different schools of thought that are collectively known as postmodernism. And they were critiquing this idea and sort of figuring out, okay, where did we go wrong in the new world as we picked up the pieces of what modernism left us. And this brings us back to trying to define what postmodernism is. My favorite single definition of postmodernism is by the French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard, who said, postmodernism is an incredulity towards meta-narratives. So I wanna break that down to help understand what postmodernism is. First off, meta-narratives. Really, a meta-narrative is anything that tries to combine the experiences of an individual in a single story or a single experience or a single understanding. Sometimes they're called universal truths or objective truths, but really it's just a way of understanding the world in one precise story. So famous meta narratives in history are of course national meta narratives, religious meta narratives, so like the Christian meta narrative, how we understand the world around us. Sometimes this is called world views. Maybe it's Marxism or capitalism. It's really an ideology that guides someone's acts or thoughts or understandings about the world. And what I like about Leotard's definition is that he doesn't say that they 
disbelieve or hate or even question the legitimacy of meta narratives, but they have an incredulity towards meta narratives. Incredulity basically means an inability to believe in or inability to see the credit in those systems. So this is where a lot of people get postmodernism wrong, where they think postmodernism doesn't really stand for anything. Really what postmodernism does is critiques other things and feels a need to point out the mistakes those meditatives have made and that they have caused destruction in the past and in history when we look back. Of course, I already mentioned a couple of those. Using another example, a meta narrative around gender and gender identity has caused terrible things to happen to the LGBTQ community. And so questioning those systems of power, and we're gonna get to that in a little bit, is really what uh, postmodernism is all about. In fact, before leaving our definition of postmodernism, I want to talk about one French philosopher in particular, and that is Michel Foucault. He is known as a father of many things, but is hugely influential in postmodernism. Foucault wrote a lot of stuff, but he focused primarily on knowledge and power and how the relationship between the two was used to form social control. And you can probably see why Foucault and postmodernism would be so important to feminist theory, to queer studies, to black liberation and the human rights movements of the late 20th century and early 21st century. It's a very important idea to question social structures and power structures and ask if they are moral in what they are doing, if they are right, and if they should have the power and knowledge that they have, or if it is being used for abusive ends. Now let's talk about post-structuralism and like, like postmodernism, we gotta step back a moment, cut off the post and talk about structuralism before we're able to really define what post-structuralism is. Structuralism can refer to a lot of things, but in literary theory, it really is about defining texts and stories and written works into universal narratives or genres or motifs or sometimes even just themes. So as the name implies, it's trying to maybe not impose, but to seek what a structure is in any particular work. The most famous structuralist probably in history for reasons that will become clear in a moment is Joseph Campbell, who wrote Hero of a Thousand Faces. Again, probably one of the most read liter literary critical works ever because of its influence on modern tales like Star Wars. In his work, Joseph Campbell talks about the monomyth or the one basic story that most epics derive their forms and structures from. Joseph Campbell says in his Hero of a Thousand Faces, A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered, and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. Besides, maybe in a literary criticism class you took in college, you probably heard that because it had huge influence on George Lucas as he was constructing Star Wars, and I think you can recognize all of those elements in the work itself. One other quick structuralist that I need to talk about is Ferdinand de Saussure. Saussure gave us a lot of really important themes, both in philosophy, but also in linguistics and a lot of other fields to simplify to an almost criminal degree for the purposes of this video. His observation was that language is how the human being experiences the world. And by saying this and proving this in his writing, he was questioning the idea of reality being apart from language. So probably most of you think about uh, the world in terms of the real world out there. And when I talk and describe it, I'm just describing the real world. So like I have a ring here on my left hand. When I say that, you're probably thinking, okay, so uh, he's describing this thing in the real world, this reality using language. But what Saussure did is he pointed out that our understanding of reality is so married to language that we actually can't say that there is different things from 
reality, and language. But all, everything we encounter, every thought we have is inside of language. So there's no outside objective reality because everything we experience in such a way is subjective, is through our capacity for language. So that's a huge concept. I don't want you to get too strung up on that. What post-structuralism and post-structuralists did in literary theory is take Saussure's idea that we only experience the world through language and there's not an outside reality that isn't affected by our language and applied that to the structures that were talked about by all the structuralists. So they started to say, hey, if we are just understanding the world through language, and that means each of us understand it individually because language is a subjective thing and how we interact with the world, then these forms and genres and motifs that we're placing on these works can't necessarily be universal to everybody because everyone has to read the work for themselves and they have to interpret that structure. And we might come up with the same structure or we might not. So how helpful is it to put those devices on something? And a lot of artists actually took those ideas and ran with them, uh, sometimes literally, to try to break out of what traditionally would be considered art, or what traditionally would be considered necessary for painting or for uh, short stories or for novels, you know, all of these things, and started experimenting with things outside of sort of the limitations that structuralism purposely put on things. They also started to look at the monomyth or the structures themselves and wonder how different elements within that structure could be taken out or rearranged or moved around and still form coherent narratives or coherent themes or pieces of art. You're probably recognizing if you went to a philosophy class now, I'm talking about something called deconstruction. And I can't talk about deconstruction without talking about the French philosopher Jacques Derrida. Derrida and reconstruction was all about questioning the fundamental truth or authority in any given text. There's a lot we could say about deconstruction, but I'm gonna jump right to some examples because I think that's the most helpful for our discussion here. Think of a sushi roll. I know I love sushi too, right? Fundamentally, what is a sushi roll? A sushi roll is uh, some seaweed and then some rice and then some fish, maybe some avocado, some other things, and it's rolled to create that sushi roll. You cut it into pieces, put it in some soy sauce, it's delicious. Derrida would come to that and say, that's interesting. Let's break that down a little further. Let's deconstruct it. Um, and you've probably seen things like this on menus at maybe a really fancy sushi restaurant. They'll have, oh, a deconstructed sushi roll. And then it comes to your table and it looks much different than what you think a sushi roll should be, right? There's still rice and probably some seaweed and there's probably still some fish in there, but it's not in a roll and it might be maybe in a bowl, maybe uh, it's in another shape, maybe they're all, all the elements are separated from one another and you as the eater will choose how to, to combine them and in what quantities. That is a picture of what deconstructionism is trying to do with texts and with meanings. Let's use this in what I think is a very positive outcome of post-structuralism and post-modernism. The family, the nuclear family. Think about what in modernism the nuclear family was. It was a man who worked and earned the money and it was a woman who stayed at home and children who were under the mother's authority but they were all ultimately over the father's authority and that created safety and flourishing for the family itself. Well, postmodernism and Derrida would deconstruct that and say, okay, that's one version of family, but what actually makes a family itself? And at its core, really, it's people who love each other and care for each other, and because of that, want to make sure they are safe and grow up well if it's children or are provided for. So if we think that's the family, we can deconstruct this idea of a nuclear family and still have a family itself in many different ways. Maybe um, it is two dads who love each other and are able to be married and then they can have children and provide for them. And that's still a family full of the good things we have. Maybe it's just one parent, a single mom who has a child and provides for that child. Maybe the woman will work. You can see how this is so important for a lot of our social progress we've made 
in this last half century, but also to things like queer studies and feminism. I've already gone over this a couple times, but this idea of deconstruction is really, really important. And thank you, Derrida, and thank you, these postmodernists, poststructuralists, for doing this. Now that we have our definitions out of the way, let's get back to what we started with and talking about fantasy and how Malazan is a critique, a postmodern critique of the genre as a whole. And to do that, I have to talk about one of my favorite series of all time, Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, an Englishman to his core of the modern era. As you've probably heard many times before, Tolkien fought in World War I, but he grew up and was educated still in a modernist world. And it's very clear, maybe with the background that we have from this video or other backgrounds you have, how modernist this story is and how structural this story is. And I should say here at the beginning, I love Lord of the Rings. It is my second favorite fantasy of all time, ironically, behind Malazan. So I love it. I'm not bashing this at all, uh, but it is something to consider as you read and understand the differences between modernism and postmodernism to talk about Lord of the Rings versus Malazan. Lord of the Rings is clearly structuralist. There is clearly a monomyth going on in uh, Lord of the Rings. There is a common person who lives in a common area. In this case, it is Frodo, right? The smallest person can change the course of the future. This little known uh, hobbit gets caught up in a world of the fantastical that he never uh, thought would happen. There is a completely unexpected victory through conflict in this very clear good versus evil struggle and there is victory and Frodo is able to come back and bestow wisdom not only on the Shire but really on Middle Earth as a whole and allow for a boon to come upon its people. It's the monomyth. Obviously the details are more particular but in its basic structure that's how it works. Middle Earth as a world is divided very cleanly into modernist categories. Different races stay within their own races, right? Sometimes they interact, but their societies of the elves, of the dwarves, of men are all separated. There's no really mingling societally. And even within those structures, there are different nations that have their own identities and uh, hold to their truths very strongly, whether it's Rohan and Gondor, or elves, there are those from Lothlorien, uh, there are the Mirkwood elves. Are you getting what I'm saying here? There's a very clear stratization between races and peoples, and because of that, in ideals and morals, and those are held to very tightly, there's a very clear good versus bad in any of those things, including that of Mordor and the men from the east. And even more than that, the entire story and character of Lord of the Rings takes place within established and accepted power structures. All of the politics take place within the governments of either Rohan or Minas Tirith or the hierarchy of the elves and everything is merely accepted as it is. And those power structures are where things work and how the story itself works its way towards its ultimate conclusion. Even the way that the story is told to us is very clearly structural. There's like a clear understanding of what is going on. It's told in third person omniscient. There is a narrator, so to speak, that is telling you everything that's happening, is able to know everyone's hopes, fears, and desires, is completely trustworthy in how he tells you about what is happening. And Tolkien is quite clearly the most influential fantasy writer to Date. And so a lot of modern fantasy have picked up and riffed on Tolkien and especially a lot of his modernist tendencies, themes, motifs, etc. A lot of worlds have nations that are comprised of individual races or mono races, uh, not a lot of inclusion. There is usually a clear good versus evil. Most stories typically work within established power structures of nations or kingdoms or tribes. A lot of our discussion around fantasy deals with similar, again, motifs, cliches, and tropes. And even things like the chosen one trope or not like the other girls or love triangles, all these things are structural elements to stories that are so common that we talk about them across various different 
narratives and across even genres. So a lot of these structural elements have seeped into our thoughts and how we talk about the genre of fantasy. Now let's talk about the Malazan, Book of the Fallen. Obviously there's not just two books, these are the first two. Ten books by Steven Erickson, in which he purposefully divorces himself from that tradition in the fantasy genre, and in his own words, tries to get back to the roots of epic fantasy or epic storytelling in things like the Odyssey or other epics as well as have a twist of postmodernism and post-structuralism, critiquing really what has been fantasy up until this point. First off, Malazan and the world itself is quite clearly postmodern. I'm gonna keep this spoiler free. Uh, there's a lot I could say with revealing spoilers, but again, I want people who haven't read Malazan to be able to watch this video. So don't worry, it's gonna be spoiler free. First, Malazan is postmodern, the world is postmodern. The Malazan Empire and the army in which we spent so much time is completely integrated, not just between races in like the human race, like different types of looking people within humanity, but even other kinds of beings and races and the sort of prototypical fantasy beings that you would see are also part of the Malazan Empire or are part of other empires that are also united between these various types of experiences. Power structures are immutably questioned throughout the entire series. Things like religion and the god themselves are shown in various lights of honor or deception or goodness or evil or questionality. Empires themselves, even though it's called the Malazan Book of the Fallen, you'll find out very early on the power structure of the empire itself is quite questionable and how they use knowledge and power within the empire and trying to expand the empire and its colonial and empiric, obviously, power is questioned and its morality is always questioned. Steven Erickson also very purposefully thinks about magic as a power structure, which I have never seen in a fantasy work to date besides Malazan. And this changes the world as a whole because males and females both have access to the power uh, in the magic system of this world equally. And so that creates for the most part with exceptions an equal, a more gender equal society than we have in our world because the ultimate power is shared among the sexes, where in our world, physical power, just because of the way we have evolved, is more for the male uh, side of our species, and so that has created, for the most part, again with exceptions, patriarchy in most places. But Erickson has considered the way that magic would affect even those gender dynamics. He also, in the same way, has thought about how magic would affect politics. Very early on in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, the Empress Lacine outlaws any magic that is not controlled by the Empire and does this in a very, very violent manner. A very Foucault thing to do, uh, to use power and knowledge as a means of social control. And Lacine herself is very highly questioned and is a very interesting character, and I won't say more about that. Only to say that Erickson is always thinking from these postmodern viewpoints about power, about belief, about themes in his work and takes these things very seriously. Where a lot of other fantasy take those things for granted in a traditional way. We also see the various racial and historical backgrounds and beliefs clashing quite a bit in the Malazan universe, whether through revolutions, whether through various nations or different tribes within those nations or ideologies and groups uh, that aren't necessarily defined uh, racially, but more ideologically, fundamentalists versus more liberal groups. All of these various viewpoints are constantly crashing and warring between one another and finding syntheses and also creating conflict in very messy ways that are not distinguishable by categories of good and evil, but much broader ideological spectrums. And some people from those ideological spectrums do individual good or bad things. 
and we as the reader are often left without even enough leading by the author to sort of contrast how we are supposed to think about these things. We are presented from the viewpoint of the characters themselves. And the ultimate theme of the whole series, which Erickson will tell you even if you haven't read it, is a plea for compassion, is an individual plea. It is not a power structure plea. It is not a larger peoples or larger historical plea in some ways, but a plea to the individual to apply in their particular situations. A very postmodern thing to do. Let's also talk about how Malazan is post-structural, and this is really where I want to talk about a lot of the critiques that are often leveled at Malazan. Malazan tells its story in a way that is against traditional structuralist storytelling devices, and specifically in those storytelling devices in the fantasy genre. One of the ways to explain this is to say that Malazan is not really a plot-driven story. In almost every modern fantasy, the plot is what is going to drive what happens. Literally, you are told things so that you can follow a story as it's unfolding. Again, think of Lord of the Rings. You're told about the progress of the ring to Mount Doom and the heroes that are working to make that happen. And even when there's a necessary split, you are still following very clearly the stories of those characters, even so much in Two Towers and Return of the King, that they're broken up into two halves where you just follow one group of characters, whether it's Frodo and Sam, or like Aragorn, Legolas, Merry and Pippin, and Gandalf and the others. Malazan is not like that at all. Uh, it's not just going to tell you the story and show you the progress. Oftentimes, it is more thematic or even less structure than that, but things that are happening in the world around events and around what's happening. And that is because, going back to Saucier, we experience the world in language, and so Erickson is making us experience and form our own opinions on the Malazan world through his language. And oftentimes, he is not going to guide us about who is right and who is wrong and who we should believe in, but is going to present things as they happen. I'm not going to say in what book, but there's actually one great part where a character we've never met comes and talks to one of the main characters and says, hey, how can I get in on this special group that is around your viewpoint? And it's sort of a tongue-in-cheek moment where Erickson is saying, hey, I can only show you so many things, but all around all of these characters are individuals that are not necessarily more or less valuable than the characters you know. It's just that those happen to be the ones that you have experienced in this book. And so from a nuts and bolts perspective, you're going to get a ton of character perspectives in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. And a lot of them are, I should say all of them, are going to be from a third person limited perspective, meaning you are only going to view the world through the perspective of that character. And some characters get more time than others, and some of them you get to know some that you think are going to be main characters aren't. Uh, some are main characters, but don't really affect events all that often. And a lot of this is Erickson forcing you as the reader to interact with the world and to decide what is important, what isn't, what to take from these themes, or to show you particular moments so that you get meaning out of them. And it is a challenge, but that's the point of how he chooses to structure his work. Now, don't misunderstand me. There is absolutely a plot. Things are definitely happen. Events occur, but they are not going to be presented to you in a very clear A, B, C, D way from an outside perspective. You are brought into the world to experience it and to make your own choices about what is happening and how to understand them. Uh, perhaps to give you the biggest example of this, this is again, not a spoiler. Uh, but after the first book, uh, you move in the second book to a completely other continent. And for the most part, completely other characters. And it's not like those characters are eventually going to show up in that first storyline. It's just somewhere else in the world entirely. A completely different story with a couple of overlapping characters. And then in the third book, you snap back to some of the characters from the first book, follow them for a little while. And then in the fourth book, you go back to the second book setting, talk about them for a little while. Then in the fifth book, guess what? Completely other continent besides those two. And there is some overlap, and there are some characters that are going to come between a lot of those different storylines, but not always. And it's you, what you need to understand is it is not a structural telling of 
a plot of what is going to happen from A and rising action, etc., and falling. It is a complete story, uh, a, I should say a complete narrative, but not in the way that we often see things. So Erickson has purposely given you a lot of characters. Some are going to be thin, some are going to be well-rounded, some are going to be flat. He's purposely giving you a lot of settings. He's purposely telling you a lot of stuff. He's purposefully throwing you into the world because that is how we experience our own world. And there is meaning behind even the way that he is telling that story. So again, you might feel like you're overwhelmed with the characters. You might feel that there's not enough plot or not a lot of things going on. You might feel that it's too plotting. And that's okay. You don't have to love Malaz and Book of the Fallen. I do, and I can give you a lot of reasons why. But also understand that all of those things Erickson is doing purposefully and is choosing to tell his story in that way. And to me, it is a profound critique on power structures, a profound critique on how we think about the world, a profound critique of our morality and how we think about those things and history and how we think about those things and a very, very deep investigation of the human condition and how we experience the world and reality around us, even down to the way Erickson chooses to tell it. Oh, and by the way, there's a super cool magic system. There's super cool races that he has invented. There's so many jaw-dropping moments of imagery and awesomeness. So don't think that because I've talked about philosophy here for probably like the better part of a half hour that there's not all those great things that you normally find in the fantasy genre. There are, and that's why this is my favorite fantasy of all time. That he is interacting with all of these high-minded philosophies and ideas and yet doing it while talking about magic and swords and dragons and alternate realities and all kinds of amazing things. So please, please, please check out the Malazan Book of the Fallen. In the comments below, let's talk about this. Are you still confused about postmodernism or post-structuralism? Do you like Malazan? Are you in one of those three groups? Are you someone who hasn't read it but is now more excited? Someone who's read it and is now has some more vocabulary to talk about it? Or are you potentially someone who didn't like it, which again is okay, and now maybe understand that some of your uh, critiques, again, you can still hold to, but kind of understand where you are coming from a little more. Hopefully so. I hope this is helpful. I've been looking forward to this video for so long. So let's talk about this. If you have any questions, I'm more than willing to talk more philosophy and Malazan in the future. But until then, this has been a discussion of postmodernism in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. First in, last out.